So safety is our new preventative maintenance program for TE probes. We came up with this um, as uh, to, to address a, a major problem with TE probes, and that is um, typically when we get in a TE probe, it is catastrophically damaged. And so this is a program that um, provides preventative maintenance and some tips to catch some of that damage um, before it becomes catastrophic. Um, and so we have some tips and tools that we'll use to address that. So uh, we're going to um, talk about our objectives and outcomes. We're gonna do a technology review of the probe itself. I have six probes here we're gonna do a preventative maintenance on. Um, we're gonna do a mock preventative maintenance and these probes are pre-damaged. Um, these are probes that we got in for repair that are catastrophically damaged. And each one has a little bit different damage that we'll take a look at. So this will be live. Um, some of the challenges of TE probes, um, points of wear, um, and these, these probes have been disinfected, so don't worry about handling them. Um, we're gonna talk about root cause analysis, um, actual preventative maintenance on the TE probes. We're gonna do the hands-on session, and then we'll talk about next level success. So where can we take this to the next level in order to uh, prevent TE damage? Um, this is a uh, <clears throat> copy of our brochure, and Matt, um, I brought the, some copies along with me. And that's a protractor that we developed with the specs for the, uh, the articulation. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, there's a tremendous amount of parallels between a TE probe and an endoscope. Really, the, the major difference is and rather than a camera, we have a um, an ultrasound transducer on the end. Um, and even Olympus is kind of made that bridge a little shorter um, because Olympus now has the ultrasound endoscopes. And so it's kind of a hybrid a hybrid type of scope. And so we're gonna discuss the challenges shared by all the facilities, um, recognize common points of wear, um, raise your comfort level and technical competencies with these TE probes. There's a lot going on with these, but um, there's no magic. And so we'll talk about that. Um, we're gonna present a cost, uh, cost savings um, that can be realized through preventative maintenance. Um, we offer preventative maintenance on these, uh, these transesophageal probes where we will um, proactively, and we can do this overnight, um, you send it in and we can replace the bending rubber, the locking collars, the glue beads, and we'll take a look, we'll do a full examination of the probe itself, um, or just the articulation, um, and it's extremely low cost based um, compared to what a, um, a major TE repair would cost you. Oh, okay, let's try that again. Man, blew through that in like two minutes. It's the fastest I've ever done one of these. Okay, so TE's technology overview, um, they image the heart um, from inside the body. So the probe gets snaked down the, the esophagus and it lies below the heart and images close up. This allows us to use a much higher frequency transducer than a transthoracic probe. And transthoracic probes are much more difficult to use if you have a large chested person, um, somebody who's a smoker or somebody has, has some other conditions. Um, getting through those ribs, getting intercostal um, can be difficult. So the TE probe allows um, a surgeon, typically a surgeon, to image the heart um, directly from underneath it and it produces a very high resolution image. So technology overview. So um, on the outside of the probe, we have our control housing. Um, this control housing is not submergible, unlike an endoscope where the control housing is IPX rated for submersion. Um, these control housings are not. Um, and we get a lot of uh, transducers in where these control housings have been submerged in a cleaner or disinfectant, um, which can catastrophically damage these things. Um, then we have our image orientation controls, which are these, these knobs here, and they allow us to articulate the probe back and forth and left and right. We have our insertion tube, our bending rubber, and up at the tip we have our lens and our array. And this is the um, this is where the magic happens with this probe. Um, these arrays are extraordinarily fragile, and so just something like that will damage that array. And all these arrays are damaged, so I can do whatever I want with these probes. But um, just you know, when people are cleaning them or rinsing them in the sink, they'll be banging them around the sink, you know, trying to get some excess liquid off. That will destroy that array. Just something some as small as that minor impact. And we have um, our distal tip, which is the entire transducer tip. 
Um, and we have an adhesive glue beads. The, this glue will break down even if you use the proper adhesive. Um, this adhesive, there's very specific adhesives that we use um, that are compliant with the OEM recommended cleaners and disinfectants, but even those um, will break down over extended periods of time. And then the bending rubber here, which allows the, the head of the um, transducer to articulate. Morning. You guys gonna make me start over? That's all right. Were you guys at the bar? Were you guys at the bar last night? Oh, okay. Have a seat anyway. So we were just going over the anatomy of a, a TE probe. Which organization are you with? Wellstar. Wellstar. Oh, welcome. I'm the reason for you. That's the nicest thing anybody ever said to me. Wow. <laughs> My dog likes me. <laughs> I'm gonna put that up. I'm gonna put that in the wind column. Um, so we were just going over the uh, the anatomy of a TE probe, and so um, these are all the the areas of a TE probe. And what I was talking to is um, the specific points of where um, are the insertion tube, um, this bending rubber, and this locking collar and glue beads. And I was talking about adhesives. Um, I want to stop for a minute, and this isn't part of the presentation, but um, when you think about adhesives, um, there's thousands and thousands of different adhesives out there. So what adhesive do you use when you replace these glue beads and these locking collars? Um, and the answer is, I don't know, what does the OEM use? And the OEM doesn't tell us. And so the way we go about these things is we, did, we try and determine what the OEM used, and then we take samples of that adhesive that we believe is the proper adhesive, and we will test that. Uh, for compatibility with every uh, cleaner and disinfectant that OEM recommends for that particular device. So this particular device here is a GE6VT-D. So we'll go into the GE user manual and GE will have a matrix saying you can use all these different chemicals and it could be 30 different chemicals um, to clean and disinfect these probes and devices like Trophon and things like that. And so we take samples of our materials, whether it's a bending rubber, whether, whether it's glue, whether it's a lens seal, whether it's a lens itself, we submerge that in those chemicals for an extended period of time. We call it accelerated chemical testing. And after this period of time, we examine that material. Did it degrade? Did it deform? Did it discolor? Um, and is it biocompatible? Most importantly, um, you can't just go down and get some super glue and put it on there because super glue is not biocompatible. And this has patient contact. So we run all those tests. And after all those tests, if we determine that that glue survives and it doesn't uh, doesn't uh, degrade with those cleaners and disinfectants. Now it's an approved uh, adhesive that we can use. Because these um, these probes and um, endocavity probes, they're subjected to very harsh environments for cleaning and disinfecting. And you got to make sure that the adhesives and other materials that you're using are compatible with the OEM cleaners and disinfectants. So where are these things used? Um, typically, they're used in non-invasive cardiology. They can be used in patient rooms, the surgical suite and they're also um, cleaned in central processing. The challenge with TE probes is they are constantly being handled. So they may be used in cardiology, and then they get put, hopefully, in a container, uh, an approved container, sometimes it's a pillowcase or a red bag, um, and it gets brought down to um, SPD or central processing. Um, and then it gets put into another container, sometimes it's a pillowcase or uh, you know, it's a green bag, um, God forbid. Um, and then it goes up for storage, and then it goes back into wherever it's going to be used. And so there's there's multiple people handling these devices and multiple departments, and they're always being moved around. And to top it all off, these probes are extraordinarily delicate. It's the most delicate transducer made by any of the OEMs is the TE probe, because there's so much integration um, with these materials and the array. I mean, this particular array here has about 5,000 elements. And I was saying earlier before you gentlemen got here is that just something like that will destroy that array. Um, they're that delicate. Um, yeah, that's what keeps me up at night. Um, um, this is a, a tip protector. Um, we have them made, um, but you can get them from uh, Civco is the company I usually recommend um, for consumables. But a tip protector should be on a TE probe anytime that probe is not being processed or in use. Um, always. I mean, that's just a, a rule of thumb. Um, always have. Good morning always have a tip protector on a TE probe. So we made a note here, few other device types are subjected 
um, to as much cross-functional team usage and handling as TE probes. Okay. I know, I must have a sticky button here. Let's try this again. I may have to do this old school, go manual. Okay, so what do these guys cost? Um, so new, uh, 25,000 to 60,000. Um, if you replace it through the OEM, it can be up to 30,000. And I've seen that higher. Um, with inflation today, um, the OEMs, uh, particularly GE, um, they're raising their prices dramatically. Um, and so um, replacing these are extraordinarily expensive. Um, third party replacement, you can pay up to 28,000. Third party repair, anywhere from 500 to 12,000. Again, it's vendor and technology dependent. Um, few other accessory, and we put accessory in quotation devices, um, are costly to support. Um, this, the TE probe, and we, we intentionally did that when we wrote this, this we put it in you know, quotes, um, because this is not an accessory. A, a TE probe is a class two medical device. It is a device amongst itself. Um, it is not necessarily part of the ultrasound system as an accessory. It is its own class two device. It has to be registered as a class two device with the FBA when they, uh, when they manufacture those. Um, so what are some of the challenges? Um, lack of preventative maintenance. As I mentioned earlier, um, even when you use the proper adhesives, um, I, I talked about the accelerated chemical testing that we do. Even if you use proper adhesives, um, things do wear on these probes. They just do wear. It's like changing the oil on your car. You may do it every 3,000 miles, but you're still going to get wear on your car. You still get wear on these probes. And so they're subject to wear uh, scratches, scrapes, and minor damage during use and transport. Um, most, most of the probes we get in um, do have some type of physical damage. And a lot of times it's because whoever's using them does not use bite guards. Um, a bite guard is just a, a plastic kind of a donut, a mouth dam that you snake the, the probe through when you insert it in the mouth. And I've had many spirited debates with anesthesiologists um, who are always right. Um, <laughs> I'm a doctor, you're not. So I'm right and you're wrong. Um, but they say, well, the, you know, the patient's out, so I don't need to use a bite block. Well. Even if the patient's out, they can still have a gag reflex and they can clamp down on that probe. Um, they still have teeth, at least most of them. Um, you know, some, if, if somebody does have false teeth, they do ask them to take their teeth out prior to an exam, but most people have teeth. And they can either bite down or just the, the action or the act of taking this probe, inserting in a patient's mouth and scraping it, just dragging it across the teeth will cause damage to this probe. Um, that's how fragile they are. And exposure to harsh chemicals and um, highly acidic gastrointestinal fluids. Um, the, the chemicals that are used to disinfect these um, are highly caustic. Um, and they're, that, they're there for a reason, um, because we need to make sure these are disinfected because the vast majority of times these probes are not used with a cover. These probes are used bare and they're inserted, so they are subjected to whatever pathogens are with inside that patient. So we wanna make sure we do a high level disinfection on these. Um, these cannot be sterilized. Unlike um, endoscopes, some endoscopes, these cannot be sterilized. They have to be high level disinfected. And even approved chemicals may degrade materials over time. So wear occurs slowly over time and the results are cumulative. And the question we're asking, and it's somewhat rhetorical, is if thousands of the devices in your facility are included in a comprehensive PM program, why aren't you doing PMs on these guys? Um, This is gonna be a long one or a short one if I just don't go backwards. So let's talk about um, some of the areas where um, that will degrade. So on a transducer, um, there are seals around these lenses and that is a very specific material that we research and we come up with um, that we utilize that again is, is compatible with the OEM recommended cleaners and disinfectants, but they do wear and once they wear, you can see this particular probe here, um, that material is missing. Um, you'll get fluids in there, you'll get bodily fluids in there, you'll get disinfectants in there, you can get biocontaminants uh, in there. Um, so now you have a nook or a cranny on this probe that traps those things. Um, bending rubbers, um, they become more brittle. One of the things that I've seen, one of the um, services we provide at Innovatus is we will come to a healthcare provider's facility and we will do what we call a process analysis, a safety process analysis, where 
uh, myself or a colleague, will follow a TE probe around through its entire usage cycle. And we'll look at how it's cleaned and how it's stored, how it's transported, how it's used. Um, I've, I've watched, I don't know how many open heart surgeries, I've watched people use these probes just to see how they're being utilized, if they're being utilized properly. Um, and uh, the, actually the last one I did was with a doctor who did it without a bite guard. And he said, I noticed you're watching me. I said, yes, you're doing it wrong. He said, no, I'm not. I didn't touch the teeth. I said, but you're going to next time. You, did, you were extra careful because I was here. To, yeah, it's, and, and how much is a bite guard? It's like 50 cents. I, I don't know if it's just a matter of speed. Um, <laughs> yeah. No, no, it's never the doctor. Um, but um, one of the things we found during COVID is um, people are starting to over disinfect. Um, so if a little is good, a lot must be better, um, but it's not. And I've seen multiple healthcare providers implement a universal disinfectant that kills everything. Um, that you must use on everything. Um, well, that's great unless you use it on something like this and the manufacturer hasn't tested that chemical with their materials and those materials start breaking down. Um, one of the things that we see is people wipe this whole thing down with alcohol. Um, alcohol can be used on the control housing but not and on the connector, but not on any of this area here. Um, alcohol will dry all that out. It'll become brittle, start flaking, start cracking. So... You know, follow, you know the, the, the moral of the story is follow the OEM recommendations for uh, what disinfectants and cleaners to use and how to use them. The OEM manual is this thick and there's pages after pages. And if you want us to do it, um, we can research that for you. All I need to know is what make and model of probes you have. And I'll send you the OEM manuals and I'll highlight the areas that I want you to pay attention to. And it'll tell you all the cleaners and disinfectants you can use that they've tested. Oh, no, it's working. Um, so the glue beads on a TE probe, um, all TE probes have these glue beads, and they're at the beginning and the ending of the bending rubber. And these are the seals um, that seal the bending rubber to the distal tip and the insertion tube. Um, those glue beads, um, they use, again, a, a specific adhesive, and that adhesive has to be compatible with the OEM cleaners and disinfectants, um, but that will break down over time. Um, and, and that's even if somebody's doing it properly. Um, even if somebody's following all the rules, um, that stuff will break down. And most people don't follow the rules. Um, I've done hundreds of these process analyses. Um, I've yet to find somebody who's been perfect. Um, and I've seen some horrific stuff. I, I did one about a year ago where um, they were soaking the probe. And I said, well, you know, do you guys don't have a timer here. How long do you soak the probe in between patients? And they said, well, however long the time is in between patients. And they said, it could be, you know, five minutes or it could be longer. And I said, well, what if you do one on a Friday afternoon? We take it out on Monday morning. And that's why you're calling me all the time. And so that's, that, that's one of the things that we do, but um, that's, that's people who do it horrifically wrong. But even if the people use a timer and they get it down to the second, they pull it out, they rinse it the way they're supposed to, that stuff still does break down. Um, the articulation, um, over time inside this probe, there are um, two articulation cables. Um, there's one along the side and one along the front, and that allows us to articulate the transducer back and forth, um, anterior and posterior. And so those cables over time, they're like a, a, a bicycle cable, you know, for your, for your brakes or your shifter on your bicycle. It looks like that. Um, and those cables stretch over time. And so you start losing articulation on these probes. Come on. Um, so more than 70% of the TE probes have failed as a, um, as a result of gross fluid invasion. As I mentioned earlier, um, these control housings are not IPX rated. You cannot submerge these. You can wipe these, but you cannot submerge them. Most of these have, if they're still there, they have a ring on this. This ring is a retainer. It's designed to um, connect to a hook if somebody is rinsing this off in a basin to prevent this from being submerged. Um, we get so many probes in <clears throat> where that control housing has been submerged and that catastrophically damages the probe. Um, when we get those in, we have this, it's a giant um, industrial convection oven and we have to open up the probe, 
and we put those probes in a convection oven and we have to dry them out for a couple of days before we troubleshoot them because there's sensitive electronics in here. There's electronics here, here, and also in the scan head. And you know, fluid and electricity equals things blowing up. And so we have to dry them out before we test them because if we test them while they're wet, we're gonna smoke the whole probe if it's not smoked already. Um, so general normal wear and tear. So we wanna look for missing seals around the lens. Um, we talked about the collars and the glue beads, the seals on the distal tip, and the overly br uh, brittle bending rubber. Um, but we also want to look at damaged bending rubber, uh, damaged insertion tube, and cracked distal tip. Um, these tips crack all the time. Um, these are a hard plastic. Uh, we actually have to machine these. Um, these are actually machined. These are not molded. So these are, these are machined one by one um, when we remake those tips. Um, but they are very fragile. And over time, due to extended chemical use, they do become more fragile. Um, common to these modes of failure is each is detectable. So nothing's hidden. All this stuff is visible for you to see if you're looking for it. So bending rubbers will wear, seams and seals will degrade, and articulation will decrease. Um, accidents will occur. Accidents do occur. Um, nobody ever admits to it, but it, they do occur. Um, that, that's actually how... Uh huh. Yeah, that's actually how I met my wife. My wife is a high risk sonographer and she was one of my clients. I used to be a service engineer and um, uh, she worked for this practice in Arizona and I continually got called out. And I'd, I'd like to think she was doing this on purpose just to see me, but she wasn't. Um, <laughs> well, she said no the first time, uh, but but she she kept um, she kept calling for damaged transducers and I'd show up and I'd be like, you're kind of dropping these. And she's, no, I'm not, I'm, I'm not. I'm like, but there's a crack here. Um, these don't organically crack. And so um, um, I kept you know, having to replace those probes, but nobody will ever admit it, or they blame housekeeping. You know, housekeeping was in the last night, they must have done it. Um, but it happens. Um, and, there, and there are best practices. We have um, part, of our, part of our program here, and let me pass these out real quick. We, this, is, this is one component of our new safety program um, that's designed to uh, prevent TE damage. Um, but we came up with this program just because, you know, we get these probes in constantly and we're like, why, you know, what can we do to prevent this? Who are you with? Oh, you're with Westar as well. Oh, got the whole Wellstar gang here. Hi. Hi. I'm actually a third-party contractor. All right. So um, part, part of the part of the safety program is we can either come on site or we can do a virtual process analysis where it's, it's a very, very brief training period where we can teach you how to do a process analysis. We call it a level one. And so you're kind of our eyes and ears. And so we ask you to follow a TE probe throughout your facility. And we have, and it's a virtual form. You can either do it online or offline and you just check boxes and fill in some blanks. And then when you're done, that form gets ported over to us we do all the analysis on your findings, and then we send you back a comprehensive report on, hey, and it always starts off with, you guys are doing a really good job. We say that to everybody, even if they're not, um, because we don't want to be judgmental. Um, but we say, you know, you're doing a great job. However, we have a few recommendations to improve um, the way you're doing things. Darn it. See, it's going to get shorter each time because I have less slides to back through. Okay, so let's talk about visual inspections. So just with a visual inspection, and I brought these, these are yours to keep. And you can hand these out to your, do you, do you guys have biomed teams that you work with? How many people do you have on your team? And, and how many handle TE probes? Um, two. two. I'm gonna give you a couple of magnifying glasses. What about you? Oh, okay. Well, here, I'm gonna give you a bunch then. Oh, you're with him? Okay. You should have that T-shirt. I'm with him. <laughs> so um, these these are great, these little pocket magnifiers, and especially if you're like me, you wear glasses all the time and you forget them and you can go to a restaurant and you can use it too. So multi-purpose. And so inspect the distal tip for any gouges, cracks, or separations. The acoustic lens, again, you know, this, this area here, this gray area, all around the lens and see if the lens seal is intact. Um, the glue beads and collars, the bending rubber, 
um, the insertion tube. Um, these insertion tubes, they're, they're subjected to chemical abuse. You know, they're dragged across teeth. This particular one you'll get a chance to look at in a few minutes. Um, this one has a big dent in it. Somebody bit it. Um, the control housing, buttons and knobs, make sure they're intact. Um, the cable, this particular cable, and I'm going to take a, a tangent here. Um, these cables are unique to each probe. Um, these are not generic cables. Um, Innovatus manufactures about 85 different cables based on the characteristics of each make and model of probe. And so if these cables do get damaged, we can replace that. And then the connector, look for deformation, bent pins, corrosion, oxidation. This particular probe, this is a GE probe, this is a pinless connector, um, but these pins can get oxidized if they're exposed to the wrong cleaning materials. And so the way to fix that is um, you can take an alcohol prep pad and just take a prep pad and wipe these down and that alcohol will evaporate and that'll clean any oxidation off of that. And they're just abrasive enough to clean them. Um, but some of these other probes here, like this particular Phillips probe, or this is a GE probe, um, these pins, this is a pin probe, this is an older model, these pins can get bent. Um, you want to inspect that. Um, the problem with bent pins is multiple. One is, okay, if you have a bent pin or two, that probe is damaged, but it's not isolated to that. Because what's going to happen is somebody's going to take that probe and they're going to plug it into a machine and it's not going to work. And they're going to say, well, wait a minute, this, this has to go in. And so they're going to go like that and they're going to jam it in and lock it. And so now those bent pins, those damaged pins on that probe, they're going to damage the connector board on the machine. So now you have two problems. You have a damaged probe and now you have a damaged machine, but it gets better because then they're going to unplug that probe and then they're going to plug another probe into that damaged port and it's not going to fit right and they're going to jam that probe in. Now you've damaged another probe and it goes on and on. And so you want to constantly inspect the pins on these probes and the ports on the machine to make sure none of those pins are damaged because that problem will only grow because these probes move around. Nobody plugs in a probe and leaves it there. They plug that probe into another machine. They plug other probes into that bad port. So you always want to check pins. Um, mechanical inspection. So you want to look for um, dead spots or lack of articulation and deflection. Um, I have these um, for you guys to take home. These are a protractor that we developed. And it has the approximate specifications. That's my boss. <laughs> Thanks. Loud applause when I'm done here, by the way. Um, and so we, we have the deflection. Thank you. I know, 12 bucks an hour just ain't cutting it these days with gas prices. Um, so th what, this, what this protractor will allow you to do is check the deflection of your probe, and we'll do that today. Okay, so now we have a hands-on session. So we're gonna visually assess the probes using our magnifiers. And these have uh, a little built-in light. So you can turn on this little, I think it's, there we go, you gotta hold in the button. So you hold in that button, yours is strobing. I don't know if we paid extra for that or not. Um, so we're gonna use those lighted magnifiers to take a look at these probes and we're gonna visually assess them, we're gonna assess the articulation, and then we're gonna review our findings. So, um, uh, might be easier if you guys just got up rather than us pass around probes. You guys wanna just get up and kind of stretch your legs a little bit and, and we can start with some of these probes. Just um, go ahead and grab one and take a look and look at those areas that I just talked about. Um, look at the tip, look at the lens seal, the bending rubbers, the insertion tubes, locking collars, all that, and see what you find and I'll kind of meander around. So just yeah, pick one. And I don't know if you need the magnifier if your eyes are better than mine. And the lighting in here isn't all that good either. Let me see if I can turn up the lighting a little bit. Let's see, there we go. We'll just crank it up for a little bit here. So is this one kind of like a bite damage or just a tear? That's a tear, yeah. Okay. I know. Oh, 
Oh yeah, all that seal is shot. Mm -hmm. And you'll notice some of these probes are discolored. It's in all likelihood, these probes were used. Um, somebody used a disinfectant that was not an approved disinfectant on these probes. Uh, this, this cable oh, here probably, yeah. oh, even the, the insertion tube, there's one over here that's highly yellowed up towards the tip. And, and somebody probably used a, an unapproved disinfectant. Sure. Yep. What's that? Yeah. Yeah, there's your problem. How long is your turnaround time? Um, it depends on the extent of the damage. Um we we do have a program um that what we do is um we have multiple programs but uh the one that is the fastest turnaround time is you call in for a loaner we send you the loaner you send your device in hope as quick as possible please um because we have a loaner out now and then we'll assess your your device so say say um greg you sent this in and we send you a loaner and the loaner that you get is completely restored tip to tail it's it's pristine we look at it, we say, you know what? It's a great probe that you sent in. The only thing it really needs is a bending rubber. Everything else is fine. And the bending rubber is, you know, we'll call it 1200 bucks. I, I don't know what the exact cost is for that particular probe, but it's somewhere around 12 to $1,500. And so what we'll do is we'll call you and say, you know what? Would you like us to repair it for 12 or $1,500? Or would you like to keep our loaner for 12 or $1,500? Um, the beauty of the keeping the loaner is multiple. One is, you get a fully restored probe for the price of the repair. Um, we give you a full warranty from tip to tail because you kept our loaner as opposed to me just warranting the component that we repaired. Um, and you don't have to worry about loaner damage. You don't have to worry about, and you're saving on one leg of shipping um, because you're not shipping the loaner back and we're not shipping yours back to you. You're saving on time because we've turned this around in 24 hours. It, apparently, yes, it's early. Um, and so I love that program because that that helps us keep our loaner inventory down a little bit, and it keeps that loaner uh, inventory velocity going fast. Um, we we have about um, Dave, plug your ears. <laughs> we have about eight to ten million dollars in inventory, um, which is really expensive to maintain. And so one of our goals, um, and it has been for some time now, is how fast can we turn that stuff. Um, because what one of the challenges is we send out a loaner and it takes a week or two to get the repaired device in and we repair the device, we send it back and then, you know, people's problems are solved. So they sit on our loaner for two or three weeks. Um, and when you do, you know, when you're doing a thousand, you know, probe repairs a month, if not more, um, you think about all those loaners out in the ether, it gets really expensive for us. So for us to keep our costs down, um, we ask that everybody does everything in five business days. It's, you broke my probe? You got a PO? <laughs> Put it on my tab. God, how many times have I said that? Put it on my tab. <laughs> um, so so we, we can do that. We can we can allow you to keep the loaner at the repair price, uh, which is a, it, the, the program is better for you guys because you're getting a better warranty and you're saving money on shipping. Um, and you're not damaging my loaner. Um, and it's better for me because I have your device back in. I can repair it and get it back on the shelf immediately. So it's good for us and it's good for you guys. I love that program. I mean, there, there's absolutely no, no loser in that program. It's a win-win for everybody. And this, the 6VT-D, um, these are a bear to fix. Um, we just, uh, we recently had a technological breakthrough on that probe that bumped our yield rates up to uh, well over 90%. Um, we have a super high yield rate on that probe now. So, yes, yeah, we um, there was a there was a, a a problem with that probe that nobody in the industry could fix, including GE. And one of our technicians um, segregated himself uh, for a couple of days and figured it out. Um, and so we we ran the the repair through our our quality system. Everything works. It's repeatable. And so now our yield rate on that probe is through the roof, which is super exciting. Mm -hmm. 
Yes. There are a lot of um, nuclear breakages. Let's look at the cure for this is really. In, um, there, there's over um, 140 uh, coaxial cables in here. And these can break. Um, typically, um, we don't get too many breakages on these cables. Um, it's, it's more from the control housing up. Uh, where we get breakages on cables is more on the transthoracic probes. Like the, the cousin to that probe is the X5-1. That's the probe that's used transthoracically. And it's because of the, the position of the sonographer and the position of the patient that the strain relief where the, the cord goes into the scan head, it's constantly getting torqued. And we get cable breaks on um, any transthoracic cardiac probe. Um, you're going to have cable breakages constantly. And it's not the, it's not the fault of the repair provider you know, um, or the manufacturer. It's just the way the thing is used. It's just a super high wear item. Okay, so let's take a look at, let's take a review here and see what we had. So uh, probe number one, where is number one? Here it is, the Philips X8. So we had, um, is it Tiana? Yeah. Tiana saw that we had a cut in lens and a seal missing. Um, now, what, what we didn't see is, you know, bio burden at the bending um, or, uh, or locking collars. Um, um, you can see that this brown, um, it's, you know, in, internally we call it crud. Um, these probes have been decontaminated, but um, when you do have materials missing, um, it will aggregate um, bio burden. It'll uh, aggregate debris. Um, and so, and we also have a broken insertion tube near the control housing. So on this particular one, um, down by the control housing, this insertion tube is broken down here. And so one thing we do at Innovatus that's different than um, the rest of the industry is a, a common practice when you have a bad insertion tube, like this, this tube is, is discolored and degraded. There's a kink in it. Um, one thing we do that I don't believe anybody else does is there's a common industry practice where people will recoat and relabel the tubes. And it's a way of saving the tube. Or if a, a probe has excess leakage current, um, by recoating and relabeling it, you're adding a layer of insulation on that probe so that probe won't leak as much current. Um, that's not the right way to do it. Um, the right way to do it is, and, and actually the, we don't charge any more for this. Um, we used to recoat and relabel. We did a lot of studies on this and we determined that recoating relabel is not a best practice. And so we stopped that several years ago um, and we started putting a brand new tube on every probe that comes in that has a damaged, discolored, degraded tube, we put a brand new tube on. Um, it doesn't cost our clients anymore and you are getting a brand new tube that articulates the way it's supposed to. It contains, you know, it contains the leakage current the way it's supposed to. The labels, um, you know, the numbering, the indexing is, is all pristine. And so recoding and relabeling, it's, it's old school. Um, it shouldn't be done any longer. If, if you have a problem with your tube, Correct. Yeah, it'll it'll wear out over time. So we just prefer to put a brand new tube on, and we do thousands of these a year. Um, and we, um, this particular one did have a, a dent in the tube too. Anytime you have a dent in the tube, in all likelihood, um, it is from a bite mark. Um, how are we doing on time? Okay, thank you. Um, Vast majority of time, it is a, a bite mark. Although I had one that I wish I have the picture somewhere on my phone. Um, I don't want to take the time to find it though. But I had one client that they were going to outsmart the care and handling of the OEMs, and they decided to build this rig on a machine. And they had this PVC tube that went up that they used to store the TE probe in, and it kind of hung off the side of the machine. And we kept getting these probes in where there were kinks way down here, and. And it was a local hospital to me, and I, I called the biomed director. I'm like, I, I don't understand what the heck you guys are doing. We're getting kinks way down here. Unless you guys are scanning giraffes or something along those lines, there's no way you can kink it down here. Because, the, I mean, the, the probe line goes in about yay far when you're doing a transesophageal exam. And it turns out they were putting it in this tube, and as they were going around corners, that tube was snagging on doorways, and it was cracking, and they were kinking the probe. And it's kind of like a garden hose when you kink it. It's, you know, that kink is, is there forever. Oh, no. Oh, good Lord, I exited out. Was it called the probe shuttle? Um, that was my old company. Oh, was? Yeah. 
yeah, that, 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 that was kind of a, a marketing flop. Um, yeah, we, what we recommend, and, and this, this is, like I said, this is one component of the safety program. There's three other components. Um, I'd love to sit down with you guys and I can talk about some of the other things that you can do, some of the best practices, but um, TE probes should be transported in a large bin. Um, you should never coil these long or shorter than a one foot diameter. Um, and then those bins, you should have a, a contaminated bin and a clean bin. So it gets transported in a contaminated one. And then once it's cleaned and disinfected, it goes into a clean bin and it goes back for storage. They should never be stored in those bins because these, these insertion tubes, um, they will create a memory. And if you keep them coiled over an extended period of time, they're gonna wanna stay coiled. And so they should be hung in a tube um, in an in approved uh, cabinet, um, ideally a cabinet with positive air pressure. Um, um, that they have a HEPA filter on there and they have positive air pressure. And that positive air pressure, if that cabinet is pressurized, it keeps you know, dust and debris out, out, of the, um, out of the cabinet and off the probes. So number two, um, we had a perforated bending rubber. Tiana found that one as well. And we also had a pinch cable. So something pinched that cable. Now these cables, um, where's number two? Here it is. So these cables, if these do get pinched, um, is if the pinch is cosmetic, um, we have a technology where we can actually take this um, uh, this um, jacket, this uh, cable jacket off, and we can actually insert the um, the coaxial cables into a new cable jacket. Um, we're the only ones out in the in the industry that can do it. We we develop most of the equipment and instruments that we use. We design and build in house. You can't buy this stuff on the open market. We've figured out how to do these things. Um, so if you ever get a chance to come to Tulsa, um, um, we welcome guests. Uh, we can either do a live tour, you can come and visit us, or we can do a virtual tour um, where we can do it via Teams and we can stream a tour and take you for a, an entire tour of our shop. Oh, we'd love to have you. Now, now that the, the pandemic is over, at least as far as I'm concerned, um, we're, we're receiving guests again. So please come and visit us. Yeah, there's, and, there, and there's some things we can't show on Teams. Um, we have some, some of the things that we do are very proprietary. So, um, you know, we don't, we don't allow them to be streamed and, or photographed. We do have to frisk you before you go into the shop. Um, okay. So the GE6VT, um, again, we have a perforated bending rubber. The tube is broken due, due to a bite. These are all preventable. Um, the, the bending rubber is damaged. And then we have damage um, right here at the uh, distal tip and uh, this locking collar here. Oh, for God's sakes. This cannot be indicative of the rest of my day. <laughs> um, so the Phillips X8. So the bending rubber is very brittle and we're missing some, uh, some of the glue bead here. And again, we have bio burden um, once you start missing materials, then you start collecting bio burdens. Um, and that's always a bad thing. Um, mm -hmm. it's, it's not a time interval, it's a cycle issue. And so, yeah, if, if um, I would say about every hundred cycles or so, um, you should be doing a preventative maintenance. This, um, this 6TC um, has a, a worn bending rubber. That's this guy over here. So we can see that this bending rubber is getting worn. You can see that it's thin and it's, um, it's very uneven. It's starting to wear through. You can, you can feel the underlying um, shielding coming through. And so that's about to go. Um, and that's an ideal candidate for preventative maintenance. Um, again, that bending rubber is thousand bucks, fifteen hundred bucks, somewhere in there. Um, but if that goes, um, you are going to get fluid in there. You're going to smoke that chip, and that probe will be—it'll be a very expensive repair. Then it's gonna, it goes from a thousand dollars to maybe six to eight thousand dollars to repair that. And with these preventative maintenances, um, one of the things that we do is we do not want to issue a loaner for preventative maintenance um, because if we issue a loaner. Um, there's a there's a chance that that loaner may be damaged, and then I got to bill you twice. I got to bill you for your probe, and then I have to bill you for damaging my loaner, which we we I hate those conversations, um, and everybody does. Nobody likes them. Um, 
And so um, what we do, though, is if we get a probe in for a preventative maintenance, that probe is prioritized. Um, we can turn it, you know, it, it takes us about a day to do the preventative maintenance, and we can get it back to you. So next level success. So we have a visual inspection guide. Um, come by booth 400. Uh, we're, we have a big uh, double, I was going to say a double wide. That sounds a little low rent. A big double booth um, in, uh, in the exhibit hall. Um, train end users. This is great for you guys, but um, I can't tell you how many times I go and do these process analyses where people don't understand just how fragile these are. Um, I did one not long ago where they were using a green Scotch-Brite pad to clean the insertion tube. It, it was like watching a car crash. It, yeah, I'm a, um, or they, you know, they have a stainless steel sink and you know they get it all wet and you know they're shaking it in the sink, you know, trying to get the excess liquid off and you know just you know again banging that tip. Um, you are damaging that array, um, or you're cracking the distal tip, um, unapproved chemicals, all that stuff. And so it's great that you guys are here. I'm thrilled, but it's the end users that have to be trained. Um, add TEs to your PM schedule. So all you folks have, you know, your your internal infrastructure, your your uh, CMMS. Um, add TEs. You know, TEs. As, as I mentioned earlier, these are a class two medical device. They have a serial number. Um, put them into your systems as due for a PM on whatever interval, of, you know, and if, and, and you can't put usage cycles within your systems, but you can put time intervals. And so if you determine that they're using it about a hundred times every six months, put it in for a six month PM or a nine month PM, you know, what, whatever that interval is. And mm -hmm. And then this safety process analysis, that's what I spoke to um, uh, earlier, is um, we, we can either come out um, on site and do the process analysis, or we can teach you how to do it. Um, we have a, a portal on our website that allows you to go in and you can download. It's not download, but you can uh, follow this app. It's a five page. Um, literally, it takes you about a half an hour. You just follow a TE probe around, check boxes, fill in blanks, and you know it starts with, Where's the probe used? And then the next question is, okay, if it's used in the OR, um, how is it transported from the OR to SPD? Is it transported in a pillowcase? Is it thrown over the machine? Is it put into an approved container? Um, once it goes to SPD, there's uh, other boxes. What chemicals are used to pre-clean? Is there an enzymatic cleaner? Is there any kind of pre-cleaner? What uh, disinfectants are used? Are the, are the instructions for use being followed? Um, and that's the thing is, when we talk about chemicals, there's approved chemicals and there's chemicals that haven't been validated for that device. Um, and people say, well, yeah, I, I use the approved chemicals. Well, that's great, but did you follow the instructions? Um, so even if Cydex is approved, Cydex, you know, you soak for 12 to 16 minutes, you can't leave it in Cydex over a weekend. Um, so even if you're using the approved chemicals, you still have to follow the instructions for use on that particular chemical. And they're all different. I'm just going to leave it up here like that. <laughs> I'm done wrestling this stupid thing. Um, so sample data, actually, no, I want to blow this up. I won't be lazy. So sample data. So, um, and we, we've been doing this for about 15 years. Um, and we've, we've repaired tens of thousands of TE probes. Um, and we'll do probably between 1,500 and maybe 2,000 TE probes over the next 12 months. I mean, we do a lot of TE probes. Um, and so we aggregate all this data. And so based on the data that we've gathered and all these process analyses that myself and my colleague have done, um, we put together some samples. So if we have a sample facility, um, say it's WakeMed, and you guys have 10 TE probes, and you're having, on average, you will have six failures per year. If you're a teaching hospital, take that and multiply it by two or three. Um, cost to replace TE with your current provider is around 22,000 per device. Here's your average repair cost. Um, now your average repair cost, depending on when you catch that problem, it'll go up or down. If you catch it early, it's actually lower. Um, your annual cost to replace TEs um, with what you're probably currently doing now is 132,000. And this is your lost revenue. This is something you gotta keep in mind as well, is when a TE goes down, your facility is losing revenue and you have very unhappy um, healthcare providers. 
Um, and a lot of times when these things fail, um, typically when I do these press analyses and I do go into the operating room, um, they, they will typically have, if they're doing open heart, they will have the patient out and they'll have the patient open. And then they wheel in the probe. Well, what happens when you, you have the patient out, the patient's open, you know, wide open, and then you bring in the probe and the probe doesn't operate. Now what? And you don't have another one. Can you, you, you can't proceed with the surgery. So now you've opened up a patient, you've knocked them out, and now you can't perform your procedure because your probe is down. And that creates a whole other set of problems. And so here's your, your t, the cost of a TE program. So $1,000 per probe. Um, so the total cost, if you're doing PMs on all 10 a year, is 10,000. Um, we assume one random TE failure because they will fail. Um, and so your cost for the PM program is 15,000. So you can see the cost savings here is 90% over your current strategy. Now this is ideal. I mean, I'm, I'm a salesperson, so I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna give you, you know, puppies and unicorns and rainbows. Um, it may not be that great, but your cost savings will be substantial. It may not be 90%. Um, but if you follow all these, all these tips that we taught you to the T, that is possible and maybe even likely that you can save that much. So we talked about the root cause analysis of um, common costly failures. Um, and, and again, these, these are things that you can see. I mean, we have very sophisticated instruments that test the insides of these probes. Um, but everything we talked about today is all on the outside. This is all stuff that you can see. Um, we presented a plan proven to get results. And again, because we've been doing this for, for so long, we know this stuff works. Um, we just recently packaged all those things that we've been doing into one program calling it safety. And we've provided tools and, and um, techniques to help you become the expert to help you succeed. 